Well, Cole, thank you so much for joining me today. Yeah, happy to be here. Yeah, you're in Australia. So I was like, oh my God, it's gotta be so early for you there. <laughs> Are yeah, you an early okay. riser? Um, I'm pretty early. It's, it's, I'm slowly getting earlier throughout throughout my life. I've <laughs> never wanted to be, I've never wanted to force myself to get up, but slowly I've been naturally getting up earlier. It's been really nice. Oh, that's good. Yeah. I just assume that all yoga people are early risers. Misconception, perhaps? Misconception, but yeah, these days, yes. These days, true. These days, yes. Well, um, we have a lot to talk about, uh, but I thought we'd start off with a little lightning round um, just to front load the episode with some resources. I'm a huge bookworm. I love books. Um, and so I wonder, do you, was there a book that helped you um, early in recovery or maybe throughout your journey? Mm, I'm a crazy book lady myself. Are you? Uh, <laughs> yeah. One of the, the one that is really memorable to me is I remember I was at this, it's called Drinking a Love Story by Carolyn Knapp. Man, that one gets mentioned almost more than any other book. Have you read it? I have not. I don't know why. Oh my God. It's so, it's so intense. And this was at a time in my life when I, well, I was spent about, we'll get into it, but I spent about 10 years in denial that like, I was not, I was not, I was not. And this was like in between one of my rehab stints. And I was at living back with my parents again, which is always humbling. And I went to this local bookstore and I saw the, the spine of the book at this used bookstore and like the light was like, I swear the light, the sun was coming in and the light was shining on it. And it said drinking a love story. And I was like, no, yeah. Mm, that, mm. Is it and God I or is it, it God? And I read it and I was like, oh my. And that was really the first time that I think that I really admitted to myself, not to other people, but I read her story and I was like, <laughs> like, what was it about her story that resonated with you? You know, I can't even, I can't even recall now. I think it was the first actually drinking memoir that I had read. So I was hearing my craving and my story, even though it was way different from hers. Um, I was hearing somebody speak about the way that I was feeling inside and I hadn't, oh. I hadn't come to terms with that yet. I guess in meetings and rehabs and stuff like that, like all these people, it was not like these people, but for whatever reason, I resonated, I resonated with her. Like she spoke my language a little bit better. Wow. That's and amazing. yeah, that was, isn't like, that, yeah. isn't that interesting how like circumstances can be different, but the feelings are all the same. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. I got to read that one. It, it, it has been coming up over and over again. It's, recently, it's excellent. So. It's it excellent. I actually yeah. have a big resource list of books. I'll have to share with you. So I have oh, yes. I currently yeah. have about 178 titles on my. Oh, uh, excellent. Uh, so do you do audio books too, or just paper books? I don't because I, there's something about just listening. I can't retain information that way. So I okay. read. Yeah. I can listen to podcasts, but for some reason I can't listen to books. It's, it's hard. It's hard for me. So I'm definitely a reader. I need wow. um, the brain engages in a different way for me. So if it, pa for me, if it passes the audiobook pass test, whatever, um, I'll get the hardcover to study it. I do like to have like the book, to, like, um, Dr. Nicole LaPera wrote, mm -hmm. she wrote how to do the work. And now she's got this new one out, how to meet mm -hmm. yourself, the workbook. I love me a workbook. Nice. Yeah. So there are certain books yeah. I have to buy the hardcover for, but yeah, I'm um, an underliner. Yeah, right. I got some highlighters, underliners, tabs. Yeah. I'll have to get her on the podcast one of these days. Um, okay. So that that's good for books. Um, is there you know, I, you know, the podcast name is one day at a time. Does that phrase, what does that mean for you? Mindfulness really of being, being where you are and staying, staying in your body, staying in your life, like as it is just really a yoga teaching, a Buddhist teaching that, um, we're constantly, our brain is constantly in the past and the future we're worrying about how, how bad it's going to be, or we're thinking about, you know, how bad it was or whatever it is, any variation on that. But really the only thing that's happening is, is right 
now and that's what you need to focus on. So that's, um, yeah, it's really just a little one-liner on mindfulness, I think. Yeah. Mindfulness. I love that. Um, do you have a regular self-care practice and that could either be like a, a daily weekly routine or I, I had somebody talk about how they do an annual retreat. Does any, any of that resonate for you? Yeah. I mean, I don't do it super formulaically. Um, I've been going like on a daily, on a daily level, I, I wake up, have some water. I don't look at my phone for a couple hours, which is really good for me. I have always had this sense of urgency about me. Like I'm wanting to like do the next thing. And so having to pause on that and take some time for myself. And I think that when I do that, I'm like letting myself know that this time is important. Like I'm not giving away my space yet. Mm -hmm. And so I'll have some water and then I'll meditate. And I normally probably just do like a 15 minute meditation. And then I'll have a little coffee ritual. I make, I make slow coffee. Is that like pour it's over? It. It's not pour over. I have a little espresso machine and I put like cardamom in my milk and then I froth mm. it. And like I do this kind of this little ritual around it, which feels really good to me. And then I try to move my body every day. And I don't necessarily always do it in the morning, but I try to move some way, whether it's it's yoga or at the gym or dancing or a hike or something, try to move my body every day. Yeah, you're and in Australia. I, so there's about a bunch of cool nature stuff out there, huh? Yeah, it's gorgeous. It's gorgeous. And then I read every day and I have a, I have a nightly ritual. Um, ever since I was little, this is one thing that's been a through line for me is that I've always read myself to sleep. And I like, I can't just lay down and go to sleep. Like I actually probably do it five times a year if I'm that tired, wow. but I always read myself asleep. And I've been drinking kava at night as well. So it's a little nightly ritual. And I've been, I guess I went on a meditation, as well. but honestly, I do lots of self-care. I do lots of travel. I teach a lot of retreats. Mm -hmm. So I'm in, I'm kind of in that world a lot. But it is interesting yeah. question of like how much do I do actually for myself, like dedicated that time is something probably need to look at a little bit. That's a little yeah, different. Actually. Yeah. I, I teach a lot too. So it's, it's a little bit, it's, you're familiar with the subject matter while you're doing it, but it's a different experience to be, re, you know, focused on receiving. Yeah. Yeah. Well, today I'm actually headed, I'm doing it today. I'm going on a retreat today. And I'm going with, it's a four day retreat and going with a friend of mine. And I haven't been on a retreat in a really long time. I've been on some meditation retreat, but this is like a yoga and wellness retreat. Oh, that sounds but I haven't lovely. Been on a really long time. And then I teach two more. I teach a couple after this. So like I'm receiving first, I'm going to go fill up and then on. Mm, love that. Fill your cup first. Love that. Um, what do you do for fun these days? I'm, a, I'm just, I'm kind of a travel junkie. I'm thinking about it all the time. Where, where am I going? What's happening? I'm getting ready to head to Bali next week where I'll stay for six weeks and go. I used to live there. So I have a lot of friends there and we, yeah, go to waterfalls, go to um, cafes, you know, do little adventures, surfing, different things. If I'm in a winter town, Colorado, that's where my parents live and we're snowboarding or ice climbing. Um, wow. depends on where I'm at, I guess, but yeah. yeah, I like to be, I like to be outdoors and yeah. Yeah. Be in nature. That sounds amazing. Um, okay. So let's talk a little bit about how we got here. You mentioned, um, before we started recording, you mentioned, you know, starting early. So mm -hmm. I'm always curious about like what the childhood home life was like. I feel like that sets the stage kind of for the um, the rest of our lives, really. So can you tell me a little bit about what it was like growing up and kind of what led you or where you started drinking or using? Yeah. Yeah. So I grew up in Oklahoma in middle America. I'm an only child. Um, my parents were both quite introverts. I was an extrovert. So there's like a little bit of probably seeking that came along with that, like maybe a little bit of boredom at the house, but I actually had a I had a really good childhood. My parents probably, I've had to parse this out a lot. 
I think that I covertly received the message that they were busy a lot because they worked. Mm. So that was one thing. Um, I went to school and then I would play sports after school and then I would kind of come home and read. So I was pretty busy as well, but I kind of absorbed the message that maybe they were, maybe that they were busy. So I think that that might've been the beginning of where I really didn't share what was going on with me. So like if something happened at school, I wasn't, I didn't like come home and really like tell my parents. Not because there was a reason why I shouldn't. I think I just absorbed that maybe parents were busy. So I began to kind of like take care of things myself. Um, internally, like emotionally. But my parents were really there for me. Um, support. I knew I was safe. Like that was all. That was all kind of there. But my focus really turned um, kind of seventh grade-ish, I guess. It really turned outward to where I was really trying to be accepted in this outside world. And I always was like a confident kid. And really what happened is like, there was all these like uh, elementary schools in the town that I lived in. And then in seventh grade, all of them dumped together. So then it was like 600 seventh graders all in one place. And I don't know how good that is. I so, had the same yeah. experience. It was crazy. Did you? Yeah, the school that I went to had 800 kids. Same thing, like all these different elementary schools and they all poured into the same school. It was pretty shocking. Yeah, I don't really know how, yeah, how great that is. So what I noticed is that for me anyway, you know, at seven, at seventh grade, you're really, you know, you're hitting puberty. You're trying to find your place in the world and like where you are. And there's this inner hierarchy that we all have and because we're wired to belong. So yeah. once you kind of have probably found, I felt like I had my footing in elementary school. And then in, in seventh grade, I was, you know, that footing is ripped out. And I really clearly remember like seeing hierarchies almost of like, these are the cool kids. These are the not cool kids. These are this type of people. Those are that type of people. Like it was very faction to me. Yeah. And like I knew who I wanted to be friends with. I knew where I wanted to sit at the lunch table, like all of these things were very like formulaic to me. And it was like a hyperdrive trying to belong. It was, it was really interesting. It's so weird. Cause it feels like that's, that's a time of like discovering your identity or developing your identity for the first time. It's very disorienting very disorienting and like all of a sudden I'm needing to change to be part of the group that I'm a part of like so maybe like didn't care about clothing brands for a while and then all of a sudden I wanted to wear certain clothing brands and like certain talk a certain way and like do the sort like I always played basketball but my friends were cheerleaders or the people I wanted to be friends with were cheerleaders so I just remember this big kind of upheaval of yeah. changing who I was or changing who I looked like I was to feel like I fit in. And this was just, it was a really challenging thing for me. And whenever, then we went to like eighth and ninth grade and it was like, uh, then all of a sudden, like, I just remember like how cool the ninth grade kids were. And, you know, as an eighth grader, it's just so funny to think about now, but it's big stuff then. But I remember having, getting a lot of social anxiety, which I didn't have before. And I remember mm -hmm. trying to talk. I would be like, okay, I'm going to talk to you know, at the lunch table with these older kids today and like not being able to, like not being able to get words out of my mouth. So really I was having social anxiety, but I didn't know what that was. I just thought there was something wrong with me. Like I didn't know, I didn't have a concept for social anxiety. I just thought like, what, what the fuck is wrong with me? What's wrong with me? Isn't that funny that that's like always the first thought is what's wrong with me? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it seems pretty natural. I feel like everybody does that. Yeah, yeah. And of course, I didn't really go and tell my parents about it. So I didn't have anyone I was talking to about it. They don't want to tell the friends about it. The friends that I was like, I don't think that was cool. And so it was just like this inner turmoil um, of like a teenage kid, which we, it's really easy to kind of bat off at this phase, but it's really um, foundational, you know, in, in our human development of kind of what happens then. And I remember getting, you know, I started to date the date somebody and he was like a cool dude. And I was like, so, you know, like, wow, you know, I'm making it whatever. And we had sex whenever I was 14, the first time. And the first time that I ever had sex, I got pregnant. 
Aww. So here I am. All I'm trying to do is fit in. And I have this like older boyfriend and I got pregnant. And I was like, all of a sudden, then I'm at this big school and I'm the teen pregnant girl. Did you have the it baby? Was- so is this yeah. re- I'm not sure if it's okay to ask. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, didn't, didn't have the baby. Okay. And, uh, but the, like the school found out about it. Um, we chose to have an abortion. My parents did, and which was very, very against their religion. And like, that was very confronting for my parents and, um, it was the right choice and it was really hard for my family. That's a horrible decision to have to make. Yeah. And it was in Oklahoma and there were like protesters mm-hmm. outside the oh, so clinic sorry. and it was really intense and you like don't want your dad to take you because like mom couldn't do it so dad took me and it was just like oh man so I kind of like blacked out a little bit after that honestly yeah I mean it sounds it sounds super traumatic yeah 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 yeah. but actually prior to this I need to back up just a little bit prior to this I had started drinking probably about 13 so what I found is that me not being able to speak had a solution and it was putting a little bit of alcohol in my system Mm. So I remember that the first time that I ever drank, I was at a friend's house and her like older brother or something, you know, we had some booze and like peppermint schnapps and I had a little bit of it. Uh, I know. I got sick, I of, I got sick of peppermint schnapps, peppermint schnapps more times than I care to admit. Oh, oh yeah. I got sick this first night and still thought it was the best thing ever. Yeah, of course. <laughs> um, but I had some and I remember sitting in the inner tube in her pool I clearly remember this looking up at the stars and I was like I'm gonna do this forever (laughs) this right here like I have found the golden fucking key I'm going to do this forever I swore to myself this this is what I'm gonna do and that's that is what I tried to do me and you right here gotcha (laughs) same (laughs) yes and you know it's intense and you know and you hear that you you know not everybody that is a very specific isn't sensation. that weird not everybody feels that way I couldn't figure out why everybody wasn't doing this and I'm like why is the world going on like why are we not all doing this yeah well most of the world is just not at 13 <laughs> yeah so that was my sab. That was my, that was my. Okay. So that was, I, was, I could speak the way I wanted to. I was funny. Yeah. I was like, I was, I felt bigger than my body. Like I was mm. like, you know, prior in social anxiety, I feel like I don't fit in my body. Everything was funky. Everything was, oh, couldn't speak the way I wanted to speak. And then all of a sudden I like embodied myself. I filled myself out. And I was even like bigger than that. Like I had this, like, you know, throughout my whole addiction until the end, I always have this picture of myself, like, <laughs> like, this is how I saw myself. Like one of those like flapper girls, like, you know, with her foot kicked up in the back, like that was me. <laughs> that's such great that imagery. Was not true, but that <laughs> was my birthday. That was like, that was my, when it was good. That was, that was, yeah. Me. And that's yeah. what I was obsessed with. Yeah. That became my obsession. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. So you had some consequences like right away. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so but is that an understatement? You? No. No. <laughs> no, of course not. And I remember one of the first times I got drunk, we went to this place. It was like a mini golf place and mm-hmm. uh got super loaded. My dad came to pick me up and I had to, you know, it was obvious. So I like immediately confessed. Right. And, and he's like, Well, how do you and I was like, Oh, this is terrible. I don't like this. <laughs> I told exactly what he wanted to hear. And uh you know, there was vomiting in the, in the experience and yeah. Did it deter me? Absolutely not. I couldn't wait to do it again. Yeah. Same. And I just kept thinking, you know, if I got sick, I just didn't do it right. So I just needed <laughs> to maybe eat a little bit more or drink a little bit slower or like I got water really between sick. yeah, water in between. Like I actually got really formulaic with like how much I could have Okay. even in high school, how much I could have without getting sick because you know sick was the embarrassment that I didn't want but I wanted to be known as someone who could drink so mm. yeah it was just very interesting very I important drink tequila in high school that was my drink and tequila was would, your drink yeah in high school I went wow. through many phases but in high school it was yeah. tequila 
Yeah. Because I liked that facade of like this toughness. And I wore this like ridiculous, like cowboy hat, like <laughs> a bottle of tequila, but I wanted to be able, I didn't want it to just be sloppy. So I wanted, you know, I started early at figuring out how much I could drink. What was my limit? How to, you know, hang with, hang with the, with the big boys or whatever the hell that means when you're in high school. Um, <laughs> but that was kind of what I was after. Yeah. I didn't want to be one of those girls that was just like wasted and falling over. Like I wanted to like, I wanted you to want to be one of the cool girls. I totally get that, man. And it's, it's interesting with enough practice, you begin to develop a tolerance and you can drink. I, I mean, I'm, I'm small in stature uh, at the end there. I was able to drink men twice my size under the table. Yeah. Same. Yeah. Not attractive. It was a, um, it was a, a point of pride for me yeah. and that other people would say that as well. And that it also became the same with other, with other drugs and stuff, but um, it actually probably saved my life. And who knows, maybe probably a lot of us actually, how do you later mean? on, later on the, um, the doctors had a couple doctors tell me that if my tolerance wasn't so high, they're like, you would be dead right now. Cause if, if your tolerance wasn't so high, you would be dead. Cause I would come in sometimes and my blood alcohol would be so high. Like, it would regularly be in the high point threes or high point fours, but like oh one time it was five one. <gasps> and they actually um, handcuffed me to the gurney at the hospital because they committed me as if like you're trying to, where we can legally say that you're trying to kill yourself by drinking this much. Oh my um, God. I actually didn't know that you could survive a point five. He said that if I wasn't, if my tolerance hadn't been so high, like if you weren't this big, if your tolerance wasn't so high, if you weren't this advanced of an alcoholic, you would absolutely be dead. And how old were you when that happened? Probably 28, 29. Ooh. Wow. The length so of that tolerance days. of me trying to be cool, how much that, you know, really wrecked my body. Yeah. But it is interesting there that, uh, because that was a withdrawal that I had to, that I was fighting against as well, though. You withdrawal? Know? Well, I mean, think about the tolerance being so high is that I had a long way to come to get back down to baseline. So I had a really big withdrawal that I had to fight against all the time. So that's what I was trying to always, you know, in the end, we're not trying to get high anymore in the end or drunk in the end, we're just trying to not withdraw. And mm -hmm. I just had that far to come to get back. Oh like, my God. It, yeah, it, was, it was, it was intense. So you mentioned um, earlier before we started recording that you went, to, did you say you went to your first rehab at 16? Yeah. Yeah. What so precipitated after, I went, after I went to, um, well, you know, I had the, the teen pregnancy. There was a lot of shame involved with that. Of oh course. my God. My parents like everybody me. at school knew everybody at school knew. Yeah. Oh. My parents and it was with, um, it was with a black man in Oklahoma in a very segregated town. So that was just like, I'd see it on the case. Segregated town. Well, oh, meaning so like, yeah, got it. Yeah. Self-segregated. Yeah, yeah. Um, but literally they did live on the other side of the train tracks, like most of the, so it actually kind of was locationally segregated as well. Got it. But, yeah. 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 Um, they moved me to Missouri. They moved <sighs> like to be closer with my mom's family. And I really took that as like, you know, my parents are so embarrassed of me and like, mm. but I immediately found, we can sniff each other out. So I immediately found, you know, the people who drank, people who party. And I was just constantly in trouble, sneaking out of the house, parents out of town, throwing a keg party, um, parents finding me at bonfire parties. They'd be like, Nicole's parents are here again. <laughs> you know, I'd like sneak out of the house and like go to a party. It was like humiliating. But I'm wow. like, they're ruining my life. And <laughs> essentially, I just like hated my parents from this point on. And then I just had something to fight against. And I hated myself really is what ha was happening. I had so much yeah. shame that I was acting out. Um, like I felt my story became that I was bad. Like I am bad. I am bad. And so then I was validating that story. And I was trying to own it in terms of not just mm -hmm. like, I am bad, bad. It's like, yeah, okay, I'm fucking bad watch me. Like I'll prove it. So that's so the rebellious. Yeah. yeah. Like full rebellion. A full so rebellion. they moved me a couple times in Missouri because I would get in trouble and they moved me somewhere else and would get in trouble there. And then eventually they sent me to a, uh, this, this wasn't a drug and alcohol rehab necessarily. It was, it was for like troubled teens. Mm. 
So there were substance issues and there were, it wasn't like a detox rehab, but it was That's actually 16. in Idaho. 16, yeah. It was in Idaho and it was like a survivalness. Oh yeah, I'm in so Idaho. Survival yeah. Nurse, so, Zeus. so they actually came and got me like in the middle of the night because I was a flight risk. It was this really kind of crazy thing. They got me, they got me on a plane. They won't tell me where I'm going. They get us to Idaho. We had to like take our clothes off, change clothes, like in the middle of winter there. So it's kind of like, military-esque in a way yeah yeah and then we hike for like 10 miles a day and they teach us how to use a compass they teach us how to start fires they teach us how to do all this stuff in hindsight's really cool but for a bunch of like teenagers at 16 not happy about it all of us were like fuck our parents (laughs) like we're gonna bust out of here you know all of this and so that was like the first that was like the first um kind of journey with that i moved survivalist so, so like a little survivalist thing. Um, but I moved out. I wound up moving out of the house prior to graduating in like a, a stupor on a bunch of ecstasy. Yeah, it, it was a pretty dramatic leaving. I think I actually like crawled out of the house. You like left your walked. parents' house at 17? My parents house. I moved out of my parents' house, yeah. like in this big dramatic, big right. dramatic way. How and, else will uh, we do it? Yeah, <laughs> it has to be dramatic. And then it was just it was chaos. It was kind of like pure chaos there for um, for quite a while. I lived in a big party town, so dating a coke dealer. Oh, fun. So it was, um, yeah, it was quite a time. Quite a time. Yeah, quite a time. So this uh, this period. So you got you finally got when you you got sober when you were 29? 29. 20, 29. So between. 17 and 29 you mentioned multiple rehabs do you I wonder because I've seen this a lot where people that go to rehab early or young do tend to go to multiple rehabs do you feel like getting getting exposure to the programs early helped you or do you think it was more of a hindrance you know I never thought about that what I think, I don't know if the hindrance is the treatment or not, or if there is a hindrance, I think it's that when you're in rebellion phase and it's easier to be in that phase, I think when you're younger, that all of it is wrapped up with like a hell no, mm-hmm. like a hell no, I won't go like that. That's kind of what I can, that's kind of what I can think about. But in terms of it being challenging moving on, I think just starting drinking young makes it so much harder because Mm -hmm. we don't have another thing. We don't have any other patterning. I didn't have any adult patterning. I had no healthy adult way of being in the world. Mm -hmm. So I had nothing to compare it to. I had nothing, no semblance of like what life could be like without it. Like I was completely entwined identity. Um, I think that was really challenging. But yeah, in terms of it being treatment, yeah, I'm not sure. That first one wasn't, didn't have an AA component into it. Didn't have a specific substance component to it. That was just trying to get you regulated, I suppose. I mean, that'd be scary as a parent to have a teen that's out of control and not knowing what to do. Mm -hmm. Uh, It's, it's, it's a tough, tough call for a parent. I'm wondering though, did you get any like trauma therapy for the experience that you had of getting pregnant young in any of these early days? Was there any kind of therapy or treatment for you? They tried, they tried and they would like send me to like a Christian counselor or something. Bless their hearts. No, I mean, real therapy. (laughs) Right. (laughs) They tried that as well. But both. Okay. It's like Sorry. I just wasn't so rude. I wasn't having it. No, I mean I get it. Yeah. But it was just like I'm like, I'm not, I'm not talking to these people. Whether it's a Christian therapist or another therapist, it's like, no, I'm not, I'm not doing it. So I would go and just like sit there in silence, or I would go and like try to make them cry. Or yeah, <laughs> you just cannot make somebody get better if they don't want to. You can't. And I just not. there wasn't anything, you know, bless my mother's heart you know, really, of course, took it on her. Like she was a bad mother. She was a bad mother. And I'm like, or what could I have done better? I'm like, I don't think at that point there was anything that you could have done. The only thing that I feel like maybe could have helped at that point, like I was such on a trajectory mm-hmm. is that I didn't have any outlet in, in terms of like a mentor. I didn't have like an older 
sister or an older somebody who wasn't my parents to mm-hmm. talk to. I didn't have any confident, any confidant, anyone who I looked up to to speak mm-hmm. to. So I could really see like if I had like big brother, big sister type thing, like if I had somebody or an aunt who I who I thought was cool from my perspective at 14, yeah, you know? Yeah. Which I don't know who that would be. That's the only I didn't have anyone to process my emotions with. There it is. Yeah, that's so important. We need to be taught how to process our emotions. And once you get to a phase where you're like, it's not going to be your parents, which is very normal. There's a part in our adult development where you turn from your parents. You don't think they're cool and you are trying to fit in with your, with your tribe. And that, that, that's just, that's also a normal part of it. But um, I, I, it's always amazing to me. Those people who are like so close with their mom, they tell them everything. I'm like, really? Like, this is totally didn't happen to me. This sounds horrible. No, usually your but, parents have so much judgment and they want to give you advice. It's like, you can't, <laughs> they're not yeah. the ones. So that's the only thing that I can think really looking back that would have, that would have maybe shifted something for me. If I really had somebody that I, that I looked up to and trusted in order to share really what was happening with me. Because other than that, I was just like keeping it inside and putting like a steel wall around it. Oh, so hard. Sounds like you suffered for a long time. I mean, I'm sure there were some good times in there too, but tell me what happened. Like what happened to you that you decided that you wanted to get better? Um, So I had a really long journey there, 17 to 29. I moved around the country. I was living in resort towns and party, big party lifestyles. It was an everyday thing. I didn't have days off. Um, I was had lots of bottoms. My first, I went to several rehabs. I would go get hit a bottom and it would be like, I I need help. I didn't want to get sober. I just wanted to like feel better. I needed to regroup. Mm -hmm. So often I would like go to treatment. My parents would like, you know, send me to treatment somewhere. I've been to all my treatments have been in different States. I'm like all over the place going on a rehab tour. And very quickly I would go from, you know, they're medically detoxing me because my tolerance is so high. I can't, I, I have to have medical detoxes. Um, and, but then about halfway through when I'm feeling better, then I'm just formula strategizing of how I'm going to do it better when I get out. Like wow. I'm going to, you know, wait until noon to drink. <laughs> I'm going to like do, you know, all of these different yeah, things. Abstinence not is not in the plan. Yeah. So I start trying to figure out all of those things or like not mix this with this only have coke on the weekends only da, 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 da. but um so that was something that I would do in treatments there was one time there was a kind of a turning point it was just it's a big it's a big mess but one thing that I kind of like to share is like there was one point when I was probably I was living in Santa Cruz and I had just moved from, I was living in Telluride prior to that. So big party town, big ski town. So you could wake up in the morning and like, everyone's having bloody berries. Everyone's having most. It's like, I could hide really easily. I lived in Vail and Telluride and all these like resort towns. So it was easy to hide. And I bartended and cocktail waitress and stuff. So fun. But we moved to Santa Cruz, which is also a party town, but there's like people doing their normal lives as well. So it's not as, uh, as intense. So I remember feeling a juxtaposition there a little bit of like, oh, are like people going to work and like, there's like all this other stuff happening and there's like families. And and I remember feeling like a little bit isolated and I thought I was getting depressed. Like I had decided that I was getting depressed and that I was like shaking a little bit in the morning. And of course this was due to my depression. Yeah, just, this is the way that my delusion is working. And this is, then I also thought that maybe I would just try to drink in the morning. Maybe I would start to drink in the morning. And I knew enough that I shouldn't tell my, my boyfriend here, who's a major partier, but I knew enough that like that wasn't okay. So I started putting vodka in my drinks in the morning at that age. And this was my second golden ticket moment. Like this was my second moment of like the first time I ever drank, I was like, I've won the golden ticket. Uh, so this is yes. other, my other moment where I was like, ah, depression solved, everything solved. So now I'm literally drinking, you know, absolutely all day. So I have it in my stuff, you know, all, all day. And this is more when I was hiding it because when I was like in, whenever I was in this resort house, I didn't have to hide it because we were all drinking. Everybody was having a beer before you go up on a mountain. But here, this was like me with a bottle, uh, you know, a little mini bottle kind of hiding. it. So that was kind of another shift as well. 
Your your boyfriend didn't know that you were doing that. He never caught on or. He did later on and he was kind of like, what are you doing? Like, and I, I can't remember what I said, but, um, but yeah. Yeah. Um, so this, I don't decide that I want to get better until, until like the day I wanted to get better. Honestly, I had been so sick. Like I didn't have one rock bottom moment. And then like decided that everything wanted to get better. I had numerous, numerous. And I was in Austin, Texas, though, when I actually did get sober. I'd been to a treatment there. I'd went to a 90-day treatment. The other ones had been 30 days. There's a big difference. There's a big difference. I was not happy about it. But in hindsight, there was such a big difference there because your brain's just so messed up. It's so mush. So I had a lot more clarity after 90 days. And I had, then I went out and I lived in sober living, which was really supportive for me but I hated it. Again, I didn't want to be there. And then I wind up relapsing. I had hid bottles all over the sober living place, forget where I put them. And they kicked me out. And then I went on a rampage, ended up in detox, broke out of detox with somebody that I like had a love affair with. And then we started doing heroin, which is something that I hadn't done prior. He was a junkie. And that really thankfully and gratefully like brought me to my knees quite quickly. And I, in the end, I had an overdose and I maybe, I don't know, a mini stroke. We're not really sure what happened, but in the end of that, I went back to this little room that I had rented and I was going to fix myself, which normally means I was going to, I went and bought a bunch of booze. I had some pills and I was going to like nurse myself back to health, Mm -hmm. um, in this little room, like, so drank a little bit to bring myself you know, back to some type of homeostasis, which wasn't sober for me. It was just like functional and nothing was happening. The Xanax wasn't working. The booze wasn't working. Nothing was working. Like nothing. I wasn't getting any relief from it. And I got really, really scared because that is, that's the only thing that worked. It's the only thing that I knew that would work. And I remember somebody, I remember in the rooms, they used to say, one day it's just not going to work anymore. And I actually think what they meant by that was that one day the way that you're living is not going to work anymore. But that day, I thought that they meant one day, like the substance is not going to work anymore. Um, and I was like, oh, I just like got goosebumps everywhere. But I was like, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. Like, this is the day. Like, this is the day. Like, it actually is never going to work again. And I recall th- this trip that I had just been out of this. I remember this one thing that somebody said, it was like, it was a tech that was there. There's always one thing that like seeps in. I was there for 90 days. And this one thing that came and saved my life at the end is I, I had asked her like, how do you do it? Like, really? Like, how, how do you do this? And she said, one day you're going to realize that you can be high or you can be happy. And that even though those two things used to go together, they're never going to go together again. Then you'll be done. And I couldn't understand that when she said it because I don't I couldn't understand that ever happening but it happened in that day when I was trying to take the pills trying to drink and I was like oh, this is never going to work again and that was it that is I amazing. called that sober living place that I went to that I'd been kicked out of a few months prior and I said will you take me back and they should not have taken me back because I put everybody in danger there and I didn't have any money and they had one room that they reserved for um, high risk people because normally they only take you out of rehab. So there's one house that took high risk people that didn't come out of treatment. And there was one room in this one house that took people that didn't have any money. And she took me back and she said, come on Wednesday. And I showed up on a Tuesday night and I said, I will sleep on your couch. And that was it. That was the only time I've ever done that. The only time I've ever asked for help, really, like genuinely. And that was nine years ago? Mm-hmm. that's amazing yeah. you just must have been really ready at that point I was exhausted I was exhausted yeah. and I realized that after that you know that overdose I'm like people have been telling me for years that I was going to die like yeah. I was really severe yeah. and um but everyone had cut me off scared to answer my phone call or that any phone call when my mom was saying any any time the phone rang it was terrifying to her I just thought it was done and um 
but everybody else knew for a really long time. But at the end that day, I was like, I don't want to die. Like I never signed up for this. Like I did this so I could feel big in my body. Like that's why I started this. I wasn't on a death mission. I was in it to feel big. And like, I finally admitted to myself that like what everyone else was saying was true. It's like, I am going to die. So you started your recovery journey. Did you do 12 steps? Yeah, I did in the beginning. Yeah. And you'd like I had been in and out steps for like right. the, the decade prior. A whole t- well. 10 years. Yeah. Yeah. Because but- it was, um, yeah, all, most all the, all of the treatments besides one, I went to Scientology, the Scientology rehab doesn't use 12 steps, mm. but, um, most all of them, most all of them use 12 steps. So I would use it in treatment and then out of treatment when I was, when I was. Yeah. So it sounds like, I think from our earlier discussions, you mentioned you participated in 12 steps um, and have since found other things. And I'm always really interested in hearing like what other things work for people. I understand that the 12 steps is not for everyone. And, um, but it sounds like you got what you needed from it and were able to incorporate other things. So what other kind of things were helpful to you to heal like that trauma that you know, lived in your body? Well, the first thing was, was yoga. And one of the treatment centers that I'd went to about four years prior, that was the first time that I was introduced to yoga. It was a really powerful experience. It was in um, a rehab in Santa Cruz. And it was, it was, it was really powerful. And I I didn't know why, I didn't know why this felt like it was working. It was something. And one thing that I remember the teacher saying is she was telling us like the meaning of namaste. And she was like, my higher self sees your higher self. And I was like, I don't think I have a higher self. (laughs) Oh, really? You didn't think you had one? No, 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 no. I thought it was a piece of shit. I absolutely Mm. didn't think that. So when she says that my higher self sees your higher self, I was like. Who are you talking to? This is a big concept for me. Yeah. To think like, oh, so maybe what I do is a thing but maybe what would I do if I was acting out of my higher self if I was acting out of my best interest Mm. then maybe I would do something different so I began to be able to see like there were two different options here you know and that was just a really big component to me and all the stuff that she talked about in the yoga practice like so she would blend in you know some yoga philosophy and kind of blend it in with the steps and there was like it was all kind of it was all maneuvering in there and I'd always been a big mover as well I always played sports I always was really active so to get back in my body in that way as well Mm -hmm. um physically and to move my breath around to move my body around it's like we're storing this stuff in our bodies so our bodies don't understand language it doesn't understand my story it understands stress threat safety. So being able to, to be back in my body was really, really helpful. And I didn't know why I just knew it worked. And I remember thinking like, if I ever get sober, which I'm not, both of those things happened at the same time. If I get sober, but I'm not, then I'm going to come back and look at this yoga thing. So when I did get sober, I signed up for like 30 days for $30. That's all I had at this yoga studio in, in Austin. And I just went every day and I had been spotted if I ever was doing well, I was going to yoga to this, but anyway, I like fully dedicated to like just going every day, going every day. So at the beginning I was doing reading, going to yoga. That's beautiful. I, you know, it's so interesting because I feel like that early period of sobriety, it is a period of uh, redefining who we are, like redefining our identity. Like I identified as the party girl or the bad girl. Um, I related to that when you were talking about that. I grew up in the, in the church, which is kind of why I was joking about, you know, the Christian religion, which is yeah. probably not funny to some people, my apologies. Um, but I had this idea that if I couldn't be good, I was going to be good at being bad. And when I got yeah. sober, I had to reorient to, you know, I'm a good person that was operating out of survival mode. Like it was like through this lens of compassion that I never had before. Was that similar to your experience of re you know, sort of, you know, rediscovering and maybe re, re reinventing yourself a little bit? Yeah, definitely. It had to be, well, my whole life had to be reframed. Like everything had, everything had to be reframed. Um, I had an excellent therapist. I had a really, really excellent therapist and that she was my therapist in 
well, she, she was at my rehab, but continued to be my therapist for a few years after that. What kind of therapy did she do? Was it like EMDR or CBT or? It was a uh, CBT style. Okay, the cognitive behavioral therapy. Yeah. 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 And yeah. she also did like, we, I was doing a lot of holotropic breath work with her as well. She was a facilitator, which was something. What kind really of breath work? Holotropic breath holotropic. work. Holotropic. I don't, what, tell me about that. I don't know that word. Oh, look that up. It's really powerful. It's, okay. um, it's really deep, almost hyperventilation breath. Oh, and I have do done that. Yeah. They do it with like really loud and like evocative music and it really ignites, it ignites the subconscious and it helps you move shit through and it like brings up either somatically or sometimes like quite literally things that have happened in the past, but it kind of makes it more workable, allows you to move through them in ways. It's, it's, it's at the subconscious level. It's like you have this inner kind of guide that's supporting you, like letting you figuring out where it's safe for you to go. It's, it's quite quite mysterious. But I went powerful. to, I went to this thing, they called it a radiance breath workshop and, mm -hmm. and a girlfriend of mine, we, we went and we did this, it much like you're describing, right. The almost like hyperventilating. And I remember releasing some yeah. crazy stuff. And my friend was like super conservative, like reserved. And I was like, wiling out over there. She's like, what the hell's going on? But I walked out of that experience. Like it was like a free high is what it was. I think the release, like the absence of all that was, that I was holding was such a relief. Yeah. Yeah. So it sounds, it's, but it's, it's called really holo holotropic. Holotropic is kind of probably where a lot of these other ones have stemmed from. Ah, okay. After, the, the way that they actually found it, it's really interesting. The way that it was actually founded is the Stanislav Grof is who started holotropic breath work, but he used to work on the acid tests back whenever they were studying um, LSD or oh. um, for alcoholics, for people mm -hmm. with depression. They were doing these studies back in the, back in the uh, like 60s, 70s. Yeah. All and that's coming that, back. It's very exciting. It got schedule one. So they couldn't, it was illegal. So they couldn't use it anymore. So they were trying to find ways to induce an a um, expanded state of consciousness or non-ordinary state of consciousness, they call it, to still be able to do that work. So he studied and went around and was trying to find all these different ways that cultures have used this in the past or have used breath or like, you know, some cultures use breath, some people use um, fasting or sweat lodge. Mm -hmm. There's all these different ways that cultures have provided these non-ordinary states of consciousness, but he decided to work with breath and created a template of how to do this. And they use the same format, like in the LSD studies, they would use like at the end, you draw a mandala because they want you to stay in your right brain rather than talk about it. Like, so you'd use art, yeah. but anyway, so it's the same format of that. And that is where whole breath breathwork started. And then all of these kind of other breathworks then came from kind of that main template, Yeah. but it's fascinating. And he's a whole, there's many, many books about it and the philosophy about it. And it's really one of the beginnings of like, or it's really integrated into transpersonal psychology. But mm, yeah. fascinating. Yeah, it's amazing all these different modalities. You know, when you when you're sort of in the 12 step world or when you first get into the recovery world, you don't actually realize like how many different modalities are available. There's so mm. much that's available. So that's that's why we talk about solution all the time. So, now, so tell me a little bit about the the work that you do and the programs that you offer. Mm -hmm. I want to kind of give people a highlight as to, you know, some of the, some of the things that you do to help people sort of move through some of this trauma and these issues. Yeah. So I started um, a program called Emerge and this was kind of born out of me never feeling that I was going to make this work in, in AA. So many things really supported me in AA, mm -hmm. but it, I couldn't, I couldn't like the formula, like there was something that was not there and it was actually just making me feel like I wasn't doing it right. And it was like reiterating mm. the story of I'm bad or I'm not, you know, I'm not able to do this right. So like needing to kind of break out and figure out what else was possible and to kind of create this unique, what, what was it going to be for me? What was my recovery going to look like? What does that mean to me? And being able to use many different things. So it's non-dogmatic. And we look at um, a lot through Buddhist psychology has been really, really helpful for me. Um, they have been talking about the human condition forever. Mm -hmm. And the Buddha really believed that, you know, to be a human is 
in a sense, to be an addict, that we all have these tendencies and it's very obvious with substance. We make it really clear, you know, we're like, we make this issue really clear, but everybody has, we all have discomfort and we all do things based on that discomfort, whether we're overeating or we're on numbing out through Netflix or we're, you know, can't stop watching porn or even little things like that unsettling dis-ease of like, you can't just stand in the line without being on your phone or, you know, you want something to be a little bit different than it is. So stop that's calling just, me out. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Talk about my Netflix and my phone. Come on. Yeah. <laughs> Leave me something. And, but it, that's what that is, is that we I all know. have that piece of this and it, it, can lead to very, very a wide spectrum of the way that you misbehave. And it's just the human condition and looking at it that way really supported me to like, oh, there's not something bad with me. There's actually some wiring that I have because having the human experience, they talked about that 2,500 years ago and it just really normalized it. Like, ah, okay. The other thing that really normalized it was learning about neuroscience and biology, like to peek behind the curtain of like, what does it mean to be a human on a biological level? We have wired, um, we're wired to want to belong, you know? So this really spoke to my whole earlier life of like, why was it such a big deal? Like, why the social anxiety? Like why I needed to fit in so bad? You know, it's like, we have this innate need, not a desire, but to, to belong, to tribe. And so much of what we do is actually had this done as a baseline. You know, why we dress the way we do, or we talk the way that we do, or any of this stuff. Uh, but we have survival. This yeah, to survive. And even though it, you know, it doesn't make sense in our modern days, it's like our body doesn't know that our nervous system is so old. And learning about the nervous system, like there's nothing closer to a superpower that I've found yet than being able to understand and befriend your nervous system and know what's happening when it's happening. Because otherwise, we're just living out of the past. Otherwise it's like just reacting to life. So getting to slow down and like get to know that has been like massive. So tell me about so, your program. How do you, how do you break that down in your program? So we go through and we'll, we'll use, okay. So we come in with like Buddhist psychology. We learn about polyvagal theory, which is the nervous system. Mm, that's uh, the psychology is kind of blended all throughout. Um, looking at different, um, looking at different key components of that. We kind of start with, you know, what is addiction? We look at it from many different lenses. These are all these definitions, different definitions of addiction from like the medical standpoint, from the Buddhist standpoint, from the AA standpoint, from all these different places. And then we look at um, the human condition based on like Buddhism, we begin to like parse out the, um, our biology as well. What's the dopamine, the dopamine system? What's happening? Why do we have that? Why are we doing what we're doing? Um, yoga calls in samskara as these habitual pathways. So we kind of look at it through that way. But everyone's been trying to describe this thing for a long time. So we have these different perspectives. So that is kind of the point of the program. It's a lot of psychoeducation. Mm -hmm. And we blend it also with, there's yoga asana classes, there's breath, there's meditation. So there's some experiential tools and then there's a lot of like educational content. I, would I love kind of, that. It's like the theory, it's, it's, it's a theory meets uh, the somatic healing. Yeah. 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 And those two together are really powerful. And then the third piece that's so powerful is that we do it in community. It's mm. not pre-recorded material. It's not like you go and like study this on your own. We come together. There's only about 20 people in it and everybody shares and you like, you get to hear your story reflected in other humans. And yeah. like, it is powerful, Like that is so powerful. And that's one of the things that's so beautiful about AA. So when people, you know, just, if some people decide they're not doing AA, then it's like, but are you doing it by yourself? Like, because that's an important thing. That's one of the, such a beautiful component of AA is the community and that's needed. You need to find that you know, somewhere else. So that we get to go through that in, in, um, in community is probably one of the most powerful pieces of it. Honestly. Just what's yeah. I would say that of all the programs I've been exposed to community is the common denominator for all of them. Yeah. 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 And I get that I was recently talking to someone who had such a deep need to do like, do it on their own. And I recognize that as like a trauma response because it's not natural to, yeah. you know, like you were saying, like our brains are designed 
to uh, be part of a community as, you know, for survival, it's very primordial, it's ingrained in us. So to go against that means that something traumatic happened, this idea of I must do it on my own. And like attachment theory would speak to that in as an avoidant attachment of, and kind of what I spoke to in my own story earlier, it's like that we don't think that we will be taken care of by the group. So we decide to do it ourselves. Oh yeah. It's so sad. We don't trust. There's no trust. There's no trust, which is why like, you know, addiction, drinking in a way being a form of that. Like, I don't feel like I can process my emotions with somebody. We're not consciously thinking this, but like, I don't feel like I can process this. So I'm going to take care of it myself and me taking care of it myself was drinking. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Well, I love the work that you're doing. Um, I told you when I, you know, before we um, set up our, a friend of our, a friend of ours uh, connected us and she was like, check out her website. And I was like, oh my God, it is amazing. I love the look of it. It's beautiful. I loved everything about all the tenants of your program. I was like, oh my God, this girl's got it going on. Um the, yeah, like the somatic piece, the the mm. science piece. You know what I love about the science part is that it sort of depersonalizes it. So it almost like removes the shame because we're looking at mechanisms. We're looking at science, which is kind of impersonal, which for me was helpful because it took the shame out of it. It took it took away that um, that I'm bad thing. It made it more like, oh no, this was uh, an, an expected outcome considering the circumstances. Yeah, absolutely. And really it is, it's a, it's a shame eradication whenever we can gather yeah. understanding Yeah, and that understanding like match with compassion. <laughs> Buddhists would say that Buddhism would say that those are the two wings of the bird is like compassion and wisdom. I mean, those two ah. things together, like allows the, allows the flight and, um, mm that's, it's really, it's really powerful. The more that we know about what's happening, we take it less personal because it's Uh actually happening with all of us. And then when we realize that it's not just happening with us, because when it's happening with us, it's easy to say like, well, I'm just bad. I'm just bad. But when we see that other people are suffering in the same way, then you're like, oh my gosh. And there's that compassion piece. Like the quivering of the heart, you know, that you look out like, oh, but you, you too. And then it's like, and then there's the connection that comes with that. Then all of a sudden you're belonging. And it's like the pieces that you think that are going to keep you from like tribe and to keep you from belonging. When you realize that that's what's happening with everybody. Yeah. You know? Yeah. 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 Uh, What a, what a beautiful realization that is when you're like, I'm not alone. Yeah. Yeah. It's beautiful. Well, cool. I, I just want to thank you so much. I'm going to turn you loose because I know you're sitting in paradise and you're inside <laughs> and I want to set you free. <laughs> I can talk to you all day, but um, I'm going to leave links to all your things in the show notes on the website. But if somebody wants to reach out or connect with you on social media, maybe Instagram or something like that, where can they find you? Yeah, um, you can definitely find me on Instagram, Cold Chance Yoga. It's Cold Chance Yoga on all the things. The program, the recovery program is Emerge Recovery. Okay. So either of those things. And I also have a YouTube channel with tons of yoga classes and a recovery playlist too, where I'm just kind of like telling some of these stories, like these Buddhist stories or talking about relapse and different things like that. That's awesome. I love the idea. I I love the idea of having lots of free content so people can kind of get to know you. And I feel like, you know, people can get to know you, they learn to trust you and will feel safe to reach out and, and join a community, a loving supportive yeah. community that we all need. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Thank you so much yeah. for all the work that you're doing. Thank you for joining me today. And I hope you have a lovely retreat. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Yay. So good. Ciao.